I see dead people like in graves and coffins. Now, I see them walking around like regular people. They don't see each other. They only see what they want to see. They don't know they're dead. How often do I see them? Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna stop that uh, Haley Joe Osmond impression as Paul Seal. <laughs> All right. Well, first I'm gonna put my pillow away and put my blanket on the side of the bedroom. <laughs> okay. Yes, the Sixth Sense, which was um, and still is. M. Night Shyamalan's uh, third film that he wrote and direct. It's the most successful psychological horror film, but it's also suspense and a drama about a young boy who suddenly has a sixth sense where he gets to spot dead people all the way around. But we have a child psychologist that could help them not be afraid anymore. Yeah, yeah this is the Blu-ray I picked up uh, at Best Buy for only $5.99. Great deal. And it's hard to believe that this movie is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Wow. <laughs> I feel like I saw this just yesterday when I was in high school. Well, the beginning of high school. Uh, this movie came out uh, in the summer when films like The Blair Witch Project, along with Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, yeah, Episode 1, and even The Matrix, for that matter, which came out in the spring, were very popular. I mean, this was the very big summer of um, all these uh, action comedies and and suspense thrillers uh, to come out. I mean, yes, we even had uh, other movies like South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, and Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, and, and uh, several others to follow. But of course, we also had some great gems like The Iron Giants, which didn't do very well. Same goes with Mystery Man, which is an underrated superhero comedy and we even had Detroit Rock City a very funny comedy that that is overlooked as well so on and so forth but The Sixth Sense uh, came out uh, from Hollywood Pictures which only released three films that year under the subdivision of Disney because they released mostly films from both Disney and Touchstone Pictures at the time. But this was also the first production by Spyglass Entertainment. Yes, this was a new production company at the time that's uh, run by producers uh, Roger Burbaum and Gary Barber. Yeah, both of which were, well, Gary Barber was at the time uh, was working with uh, Morgan Creek Productions which is owned by James G. Robertson and Joe Roth which Joe Roth um, had a relationship with uh, Roger Burbaum to form Caravan Pictures uh, for Disney which they just released their last film yeah which is a stinker a poorly uh, film adaptation of one of my favorite shows Inspector Gadget. So they wound up releasing this movie and it eventually became a box office smash. You know, throughout its 40 million budget, it actually made up to over 600 million dollars. So they really did have their own sixth sense right there. <laughs> yeah. Plus, it brought in the performance of Haley Joe Osmond 
who was actually nominated for an Oscar at the time. Yeah, it, it actually was nominated for six Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Supporting Actor, and Best Supporting Actress joining in with Toni Collette. Yeah, because she just had uh, the movie uh, Merle's Redding. And this was long before Toni Collette went on to do the film Hereditary, which I guess you know, both films have in common. Yeah, they're both psychological thrillers. Um, yeah, and I still haven't seen Hereditary yet, so I can't explain. But we also had a film called Stir of Echoes with uh, Kevin Bacon, and it's very similar to The Sixth Sense, only it's it has a, a far different plot. And they're both essentially good films. Stir of Echoes was was another overlooked gem. Um, anyway, but people couldn't stop talking about this movie, mostly from his quotes, I see dead people, and they were basically amazed of how intense those scenes were, but it also brought to the important scenes of how spiritual it is, like, you know, they're about to find a way to actually, uh, fix all this so that way it could be solved and everything will, will end up becoming more peaceful than ever. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah, and th this was back when M. Night Shyamalan had quality. I mean, he previously did Praying With Anger, which this was a small independent film that he did back in India, because he's an Indian uh, writer and director. He's also an actor too, because he also stars in the film. But then he did his first American debut that was released by Miramax called Wide Awake, which is an overlooked gem, a movie that not many people talk about, but it has both similarities. I mean, the difference was, though, was that Wide Awake was a comedy and drama you know, for all families, and it really deals with uh, the coping of... of uh, the loss of a family member and the fact that that this child is trying to go through the journeys of following I mean he's trying to find out if God does exist and he wants to be able to find out about everything that happens up there so that's basically similar oh and <laughs> here's the blu-ray yeah looks really good yeah, the Blu-ray came out in 2008, so it should look as pristine as, as it should be. Hopefully this, this will get a 4K Ultra HD someday. So, uh, yes, this movie does have special features, all of which were ported from the DVD, as you can see on the back. Yeah, you can even have the number 6 right there. That's supposed to be Cold Seer. Um... The transfer is very pristine. It looks better than ever. The way I saw it, it's exactly how I saw it in theaters. Yes, I saw this movie in theaters um, with my family. It was the most talked about film of all time. We checked it out and we were amazed. We were fascinated by this whole entire premise. And how great the story turned out to be and how intense those scenes were. And and how it actually reached its audience, and how it became so successful. Okay. So, uh, let's uh, start with the review. It stars Bruce Willis, Haley Joe Osmond, Tony Collette, Olivia Williams, Donnie Wahlberg, yes, Donnie Wahlberg, uh, Mark's brother, was of course a former uh, member of, of a boy band, the New Kids on the Block. Yeah, you know that boy band. Long before we had uh, Backstreet Boys and <coughs> and Stink. <laughs> yeah, I know, and Stink. <sighs> and One Direction. But he actually, he's he's a very talented actor. Um, he's also in the TV series uh, Blue Bloods. And he does look a little bit like his brother, Mark. Anyway, Glenn Fitzgerald, Misha Barton, 
Trevor Morgan, yes, Trevor Morgan from Barney's Great Adventure, yeah, piece of crap. Uh, well, if, if you're a fan of Barney, you then a hey, to each their own. But I don't give a shit about the, that stupid, uh, goofy dinosaur. But yes, he also did Jurassic Park Free. Not the biggest fan of that movie. I hated it. One of the worst sequels of the Jurassic Park franchise, in my opinion. Um, but he also did a film called Uncle Nino, which had Joe Mantegna, as well as Ann Archer, and of course, Joe Mantegna's daughter, Gia, which was, which was referred to as Gina. I, I gotta review that one one of these days. Uh, Bruce Norris, Angelica Page, Greg Wood, Peter Tamakis, Jeffrey Zumanis, and M. Light Shyamalan, who makes it a cameo appearance as the Doctor. And it's written and directed by, once again, M. Light Shyamalan. Just to let you know, there's going to be a spoiler warning. If you haven't seen the movie, check it out before you watch this review. So, you with me on this one? Well, here we go. The movie begins when we meet a child psychologist named Dr. Malcolm Crow, who's played by Bruce Willis, who lives with his wife, Anna, played by Olivia Williams, who just received an award from the mayor of Philadelphia, because he lives there, for his best extended work in helping out all the children patients around with all their mental troubles that they had. So that way... You know, he'll become honored for being the best doctor ever, of what he seems. I mean, he wasn't so sure if he's very proud of it. But he, at least he's, he finally achieves what he wants. That is until an intruder had broke into the house, wants up in the bathroom, and was threatening to kill himself with a gun. He's all skinny, almost uh, bony and half naked with just his underwear and that's when he reveals himself as one of Malcolm's patients named Vincent Gray who was played by Donnie Wahlberg in one of his unrecognizable roles I mean believe it or not uh, he did explain in one of his interviews that and I watched it on blu-ray was that he actually lost like almost 40 pounds to play the role trying to make him look as skinny as possible to see and more rec unrecognizable to just so he'll be able to play the role exactly what a patient looks like yeah and th this was only five minutes of screen time that he had and it led to that so he accused Malcolm of failing him because he couldn't um, stop all the hallucinations he was having until he shot him in the stomach and then throws his brains out and hoping that Anna will be able to you know call 911 and try to you know try to have him recover from his wounds at the hospital so by the next fall Malcolm suddenly works with Cole Sear a young child who's played by Haley Joe Osmond which he just goes around, you know, playing with his figurines. He wore his glasses without any glass around because it hurts his eyes. He wanders around at a local church in South Philadelphia. So then um, he just goes around trying to f try to steal all these uh, all these biblical uh, objects, you know, all these statues, so that way he'll be able to take them directly to his own tent that he built all in using all these red blankets yeah. so his mother uh, Lynn played by Tony Collette had begun to worry about his social skills especially seeing signs of physical harm that he has you know getting all these cuts and bruises on his back and his neck especially in that scene where Something we didn't expect to see where Lynn was about to uh, just about to make some breakfast for um, 
Cole. And he's already getting ready to go to school. She was putting all this other stuff away. And then when she comes back to the kitchen, that's when she knows all the, the cabinet doors and have been open. I mean, she thought maybe it was Cole that was uh, doing all this, but, she, but he didn't. I mean, that's what we explained about um, his secret that was happening. But yes, he got his Pop-Tarts and then he left and just goes to school you know, with, with his friends who just calls him a freak. The problem was, though, was that he's mostly scared all the time and unlike his entire um, classmates and he's basically referred to him as a freak. I mean, this is exactly what he thinks of. He also doesn't like to be stared at, too. I mean, because he hates it when people do that to him. Anyway, when he comes back home, and in this one big scene, when Malcolm just came to his house, you see uh, Cole's mother, Lynn, sitting around, hoping that they were waiting for him to, to come by, and maybe we'll get to uh, have uh, his psychologists um, communicate better. So, so this is where um, Malcolm decided to play a mind reading game, which is really cool because, you know, he's like, you know, just having fun with this and he tries a way to communicate with Cole. The camera suddenly uh, pans back and sometimes forward too, where he starts to move uh, backwards or forwards, that sort of way. But what he does, I mean, that was really unique. So this is where we begin to find out what Cole has been going on in his life. And this is where we begin to find out his secret that, yes, he does see dead people. You know, they're like wandering around in this entire room. You know, all of them were... You can pretty much tell that, yes, they were alive, but they're not really alive. But you can see how, how they've, been, they've been harmed. I mean, you see, you see all these uh, brutal scars that they have on their heads, you know, on their, on their arms, all these uh, cuts and bruises and stuff. And the way they look, I mean, he was trying to find a way to communicate with these people but but he was scared he actually built his own tent using all these red blankets around he collects all these uh, figurines that he stole at the church he even plays with his other figurines and he just uses it as a uh, as a way to actually help him conquer his fear you know trying to find a way to be as brave as possible to communicate with the dead. Yes, and this is what the whole subject of the film is, communication. When Cole actually tells um, Malcolm his secret, that's when he begins to find out for himself because he starts to um, find out what Cole has been suffering with. I mean, like he suffers from school age schizophrenia, hallucinations that he has and you know and all all these uh, physical harms that he got you know from these cuts and bruises all of that I mean there's a lot of things that were going around you know even at school when in that one particular scene which is really uh, intense also in a way because this is where what happens his teacher uh, Stanley Cunningham played by Bruce Norris who he was about to explain to all the students, yeah, just when one boy was just um, writing on the chalkboard telling them I would not uh, hit or kick in class or something like that. Uh, he was about to explain the American history <clears throat> about what happened before this entire school was built in Philadelphia. This is where Cole explains to the teacher that they were hanged there. You know, they were all killed. Yeah, all the lawmakers and all all the other people were were hanged or or they they did all this. That's when he begins to um, find out what's his problem, and 
this is where, because he doesn't like being stared at. I mean, he never likes people staring at him. Um, he says, I don't like it when people look at me like that. And he says, like what? Stop it. And he says, I don't know where else to look. I, and he calls him Stuttering Stanley. Yes, he, yes, he explains to him, you talk funny when you're in school. You talk funny all the way to high school. And this is where he covers his eyes and, and says, Stuttering Stanley! Stuttering Stanley! Stuttering Stanley! Yeah, the entire students were staring at him, just like how he's staring at him too, until he slams the desk and says, Stop it! Or, Shut up! You freak! And he was sent to the principal's office before Malcolm appears and just try to cheer him up about his troubles. Like, just performing a magic trick that he was doing using a penny. Yeah. Yeah, it even gets worse too when he was going to a birthday party with his friends because he was uh, cheering them up you know, using the magic trick that he has. And then he uh, goes up up all the way on top of uh, the stairs because he spotted a, a red balloon going by he wanted to find out what's going on and that's where he hears a man screaming I, I want to get out of there inside the the small closet then the two guys came and and decided to uh, lock him straight into the closet because well, because this was part of a, a party game that he was about to do. Yeah, being locked in the dungeon. This is where he was scared. Because now he knows he saw a dead person in there. He screamed until he passed out. Just when when Lynn finally came by to try to open the closet, she finally did. She took him out and was taken directly to the hospital. Yeah, and that's where we saw a cameo appearance by M. Light Shyamalan, you know, playing the doctor, explaining to her about um, that he might have had a seizure. Yeah, and it might have been, it might have been like a, a small seizure that he has. That's when uh, Malcolm was looking at all of his uh, files, going back to um, his patient uh, Vincent Gray when he was a child. He listened to his tape session that he did with him. Um, he went back, rewind all the way back to find out what was happening just before he came back to continue with the session, but then he realized that that the air conditioner was all the way up. Yeah, it was very cold. You know, having all these chills. He was already scared. But then when he rewinds all the way back up and then he starts to turn the volume knob all the way up to 10, that's where we get to hear a strange hollow voice of an old man speaking in Spanish saying, Please, I beg you, I don't want to die. Yeah, something he never thought he would hear. And that's when he begins to find out uh, what was going on and why was Benson so afraid. I mean, why is he seeing these hallucinations? I mean, maybe he realized that he didn't pay attention all this time. This is where we're going to be able to find out about the, the surprise uh, plot twist. Was that in order to make this go away, Cole had, had to offer Malcolm to help him trying to um, communicate with the dead. Try to find out... Uh, what they want and this is where we get to find out about the little girl who he spotted um, yeah she was vomiting inside his tent he came back you know, got a flashlight trying to see who this girl is and trying to tell her what she wants and this is where she explains to um, to Cole about what happened? 
So there was a funeral that was going around. He invited uh, Malcolm to join by. So that way they'll be able to find out um, the secret that lies beneath. I mean, what happened to this little girl? Where did she die from? It turns out that even though she was only sick for like two years, I mean, I think she was suffering from a disease that she had. Yeah, she was like going around, you know, filming all of her videos of, of her um, her puppet show that she uh, she performs, which is really cool. That's where we saw the secret, was that her mother poured some pine salt inside her lunch. Yes, pine salt. So that means that she poisoned her, so that way, you know, she'll be sick all of her life until she dies. So she's the one that killed her when the, the father saw the tape. And yes, she was wearing the, the red coat. So now it was up to Cole and Malcolm to actually fix this problem that they need to be solved. So that means since they're not going to see each other anymore because we learned that uh, Malcolm has to move on, have someone else uh, take over. Their plan was so Cole can go around telling um, his mom, Lynn, his secret about um, her mother. Yes, um, Cole's uh, grandmother, who who um, who is no longer with us, she t she was the one who was responsible for taking the bumblebee pendant that um, Lynn was trying to look for, and she never got a chance to see um, Lynn perform at a uh, dance recital that she had. Yeah, you know, during the during her performance, and she she wanted her to see her so much that that's why she took the the bumblebee pendant to remember her by when she was young. But now that um, she never got a chance, well, she died. She wanted to remember her, all these moments that they had, and that's where both Cole and and Lynn just hug each other. You know, they begin to understand each other very well, and they they both cry because they really miss Grandma. Cole actually explained to her that someone died. You know, someone got run over, so they're all held up uh, during an accident. It turns out to be a an old woman, you know, riding her bicycle with a helmet on. So she was um, killed in a car accident, and all this blood was co going straight into her face. You know, she's walking around just just as Cole uh, spotted her next to her car window. So yeah, that was shocking. Well, um, the next scene, and this is the final um, kind of reveal, is where Malcolm was about to communicate with his wife uh, one last time until he begins to find out that yes he was dead the whole time he's a ghost he just didn't know it so by the end he finally got a chance to speak to her telling her that you were never second but everything's going to be different in the morning but no matter what, you always will remember me. And you'll never forget. Yeah, there you go. It was a very touching ending, too. Not one of your typical uh, twist endings that just makes you, the whole audience uh, confused with anger. No, this story really handles very well. And that was the, the true nature. The whole point of the story of this is about... Having to deal with fear, love, sorrow, you know, pain, that's not to mention love, I mean everything that they had to, they had to deal with and 
hoping for the hoping to to reconcile what their feelings are and they're gonna try to make everything better if that's what it takes. That's the whole uh, key nature of the story. Yeah, I'm trying to explain it very well too. Um, I love the direction and the writing that M. Light Shyamalan has ever done. I mean, this is a man who, who at the time was just an unknown Indian uh, filmmaker who's, who's very spiritual. He definitely knows um, how to make movies uh, with special storytelling and plot twists that that makes the the movie very special. The performances were excellent in their prime. I mean, especially uh, Haley Joe Osmond because you know this was his Oscar-nominated performance. I mean, he was very good. He really plays a role exactly as affected as we expected. We definitely believe him. We definitely feel sorry for him for having to go through this particular nightmare that just won't end until he finds a way to stop it by with the help of his child psychologist. And Bruce Willis uh, plays the role exactly as perfect as we can get. And I, I really wish uh, Bruce Willis um, got nominated for an Oscar for this too. I mean, that's another thing the Oscars really missed out on. And this is actually one of his best performances too in a long time. Aside from the fact that he's not playing John McClane or any of these other roles that he does, even Pulp Fiction where he plays uh, a boxer who still remembers what happened in the past. But th this is definitely right up there with his performance in Twelve Monkeys. Like he can really play a role as affected as ever and the way he plays it is definitely top notch. And he actually uh, got along with uh, Shyamalan very well too. It really shows. Because we also learned that Shyamalan is a very nice guy. He knows how to handle um, actors and, and writers uh, very well. I mean, this was way back then. Uh, Tony Collette, um, also um, brilliant as um, Cole's mother, Lynn. I mean, this is a character where we try to figure out what she's been going through, trying to find out about Cole's behavior and about what's going on. But nevertheless, she, she really cares for Cole very well. You know, she really knows. She's trying to find out what's happening. I mean, there's even a moment in the movie where we begin to find some clues here and there where... And all the other actors were very good in their prime, too, so let's put it this way. I love the fact that this movie had a lot of clues and rules uh, that's joining by, especially that's that it's actually explained in the, the special features, too, but I'm going to explain it in, in detail for this movie. There were scenes in the movie that's very important, like for example, when um, when Cole's mother Lynn was like cleaning around the entire house, we begin to spot all these photographs of Cole, you know, when he was a kid. Uh, well, he, I mean, he's still a kid at this point, but he was like very younger, like about um, like six or seven or eight years old at, at the time, you know but he's now 11. Well, we begin to see like every photograph of a sparkle with a f flare around right next to him because we begin to notice it explains that yes, there's a spirit appearing through the background of the picture. Like it was there the whole time. It's like something we never thought we would spot. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting that we saw some detail here where we saw uh, all these photographs that has a, a sparkle. So now we know that, yes, uh, the spirit was there with us. We just didn't know it. Like, we learned that Cole has a gift. He believes in ghosts. But he's very scared. Basically what the story lies on. And... And it's not just as a simple psychological horror movie as it plays out. Yes, because it has a lot of intense scenes. I and mean, you see all these uh, dead corpses uh, wandering around. You know, where you see like a lot of cuts and bruises and 
all these badly scarred for their heads, you know, their brains have been, look like they were blown out, and all of that, too. I mean, yes, there's even a moment where Cole was getting ready for a, a feeder play that he had to do for his uh, class. Yeah, his teacher came by, actually hired him to to play the part. Well, what, what he doesn't know, though, is that there was actually a ghost that's actually helping the co out and I thought that was really clever. <laughs> yeah, sort of a funny moment there. Like, yes, we didn't know that this was supposed to be um, the makeup artist who trying, or at this rate, uh, the uh, the script uh, the script teacher trying to re remember all of his lines, help him out, perform. But <laughs> didn't know she was dead the whole time. So that was really okay. That was really clever. And then there was, uh, and then going back to the the scene with uh, Lynn, she began to find out some of the uh, all that message that has all these foul languages on there, and they're all written this way. And I was like, wow, that was really uh, that's really something because something he she didn't really expect. Oh, uh, and of course we're gonna go for the whole uh, symbolism with uh, the color red. Yes, because I'm wearing a red shirt, <laughs> ironically. Was that in the movie, yes, you notice that a lot of people were, were, or at this rate, the way it shows in the film, where, where the color red is being used in the scene where we had a red, uh, a red colored doorknob where Malcolm just tries to open the door, he couldn't because he realized the door was locked so he had to grab the keys so he can open the door to his basement so he'd be able to do his studies over there you know, trying to find some information and clues searching around or listen to his tapes all of that that's what he does uh, in the study and, and of course um, there's also the wine cellar yeah, which in the beginning of the movie um, Anna just goes downstairs to the basement, just grabs uh, a nice uh, cold, a nice cold wine, so to celebrate. <laughs> yeah. Um, Olivia Williams, um, I would say she was pretty underused. Yeah, she was grabbing some wine, you know, so that way they could celebrate um, down in the basement. Yeah. Also, you see um, the little girl's mother wearing a red coat you know, for the funeral. You see all these red roses. You see Cole wearing a red sweater. The red balloon going all the way up top of the, uh, the ceiling of the stairwell. Uh, you see a lot of red everywhere. Uh, I mean it basically symbolizes what a ghost can see and be able to appear every which way, which direction they have to go. And I love that. And I also uh, love the fact that they even use uh, the, the thermostat where they had to turn it all the way up to a cold temperature to actually give it a, a cold chilling feel. So that means the ghost will appear everywhere they go. Yeah. Um, it is very intense. It, it has a dark atmosphere, but it's also um, very strong, intelligent, a very unique thriller that's well made, well acted well done and it really shows and I love the performances again I love the writing the direction the story the twist it all worked it all connected it particular for this chilling ghost story in a way but definitely recommended for those um, who are into uh, psychological horror films like this it's worth it. Uh, the score is, is done by James Newton Howard. I mean, he definitely creates a powerful score that shows through all these other tense scenes or any other moments here and there, and all the softer moments, the hard moments, the, the heartfelt ones, everything. They're all there. The cinematography is beautiful, solid, done by a Japanese uh, photographer, Tak. Uh, Fujimoto, yeah, he really uh, showcased the uh, the look, the feel, the 
the moments here and there captured all on screen. It's very solid presentation with the editing done by Andrew Monshan. Yes, it's edited perfectly. Gives you that feel. I mean, I'm glad this movie became a, a big hit. I mean, really shows that it had uh, one true sixth sense. So that's why, you know, M. Night Shyamalan became a household name, and it shows. Well, anyway, with producers uh, Kathleen Kennedy and Frank Marshall, who, who produced it and, and tried to build uh, all the money and and try to bring in all the top-notch actors together and with, act, with directors, writers, everyone. So, a lot of talent put into it. So that's The Sixth Sense, and I give it a solid five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.